Okay. Every month we also highlight an activity related to the webinar topic. This month we are looking at extrasolar planets. Vivian White has this month's activity, Strange New Worlds from the NSN Planet Quest Outreach Toolkit. Hi everybody, it's great to see you out there. So I'm highlighting one of the activities on the Night Sky Network. You can find these in outreach resources. It's called Exploring Strange New Worlds and um, the whole write-up is there with all of the handouts. And this, in this one, it's really fun. You get to be a little bit creative and um, you imagine yourself as um, teams of scientists living on a planet orbiting a distant star. And you are on the threshold of exploring your own planetary system for the very first time. And you wanna see what kind of planets are out there. So um, we are gonna use uh, tools like NASA has, um, and it comes with this handout right here that talks about all the different ways that we explore planets. And that is um, from an Earth telescope, a flyby, an orbiter, a probe, a lander, or a rover, sample return, or human. And it tells you in our own solar system which planets have been explored in each of these ways. So this is part of the um, write-up. Uh, and then it also has the instructions on the back of it. But the basic idea is you can either make a strange new planet um, ahead of time or if you have a lot of time and some creative uh, visitors they can make their own uh, for display. I happen to have one right here that my kid just made. Can you be a planet? All right so here's the deal. Really these would be about 10 meters away um, but you take a planet that you can't see very well from where you are and you pretend you put your um, hand out together and you pretend like you're looking at that planet. I don't know if you're going to be able to get there. Something along those lines. Um, and you, look, you can look from there and you get to take three missions to this planet. Or, or there are many other ways of doing this. You can have it be monetary. So maybe you only have 10 million dollars and you have each different kind of mission costs a different amount. So you could either take a flyby, which means one of your team of scientists will walk right by that. You could take pictures with your camera as you're going by and bring it back to uh, the team of scientists to investigate to see which kind of mission you'd like to do next. Maybe you want an orbiter, and then in that case you get to go around a couple of times. Um, or uh, a lander or a probe, especially that has a bigger atmosphere that can go down through the atmosphere. Um, so there are many different ways to do it. There are lots of options for making it work in different amounts of time, but it's a, a really fun activity that talks about how NASA explores our solar system and um, the idea of possibly exploring other solar systems at some point. Um, thanks so much. <laughs> Great. Oh, and there is also, you can print out an I Explored a Strange New World certificate, which is kind of fun for your visitors to take home if they participate in this. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the basics of it, but the whole write-up has lots of other ideas um, to go on there as well. So enjoy. All right. Thank you very much, Vivian. And now for our featured program. Nicole Colon is an astrophysicist and the Deputy Director of the Test Science Support Center at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Please welcome Nicole Colon. Hello, thank you very much for having me here this evening. Um, I am going to share my screen so you all can see my presentation. Okay. And please let me know if you ha cannot see it. It looks great, Nicole. But, okay, great. All right. So I'm here today to talk to you all about the TESS mission. So TESS stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And um, this is a, one of these um, missions that, well, you know, I'll talk about it more tonight, but it's one of these that involves a lot of um, people working at a lot of different institutions. So I was introduced as um, the deputy director for the Test Science Support Center, um, which is managed at Goddard, where I am. And however, the, the main mission, the principal investigator of the mission is located at MIT in Boston. 
And there's also a whole science office for tests uh, located at MIT and Harvard, uh, all up in Boston. And Goddard, we manage the project and we offer science support, which I'll talk about, about a little more later. And then also, there's going to be a data archive that anyone can access um, hosted at um, the Space Telescope Science Institute website. And so I'll, I'll point you to those um, locations a bit later on towards the end of my talk. But um, I want to start off by talking about transits because this is a transiting exoplanet survey satellite and you can't talk about transiting exoplanets without first talking about transits themselves. Um, so um, this is a movie showing a transit of a planet and this is actually a transit of Venus that was observed in 2012. So we're seeing Venus pass in front of the surface of our sun from our point of view here on Earth. But when we look for exoplanets, you know, uh, that are outside our solar system, we don't actually resolve the planet like we do with Venus. Um, but this gives you an idea of what we're looking for when we look at a transit. We want to see how much light is blocked by a planet. And so this in a different uh, form, you can see this illustration where all we're basically looking for is to measure the brightness of a star over time. And so we're, with um, a transit method, we can measure dips in brightness. And this tells you basically how big the object is that caused that dip in brightness. And for example, you know, we have a Jupiter-sized planet, which is relatively large, um, which would cover some fraction of a star's uh, surface from our point of view. And compared to an Earth, where you see just a tiny little black pinpoint compared to Jupiter, so it's a much smaller amount of light from the star that's blocked. And so that comes into play a little bit later in terms of why TESS was, was built in the first place. Um, so I'll come back to that in a bit. But before I get into TESS, they, you really have to talk about the history of exoplanets in general to understand what TESS is going to bring to the table. And in this case, we uh, need to talk about the Kepler mission. So. Kepler launched in 2009, and um, it operated its prime mission until 2013, so it was about four years long. And this mission was, um, was designed for a specific purpose. So it, you really wanted to look at one part of the sky for four years and determine how many stars, or sorry, how many planets, <laughs> Um, there are, on average, around a star, and what fraction of stars in our galaxy harbor small Earth-sized planets. So Kepler was designed to basically determine how common planets are and um, how common small planets are specifically. And so the history of Kepler um, comes about when you well, you really see the impact of Kepler, I should say, comes about when you compare exoplanet discoveries over time. So this was back in 1989. We had just one exoplanet known. Up There's a blue point um, up there. And this, this diagram is showing the radius of a planet, the size of a planet relative to Earth. And you can see Jupiter, Neptune, Earth's um, lines are marked. So you know, for reference, this one planet was several times the size of Jupiter. Back in 1989, that was all we had. Fast forward till 2009, right before the Kepler launch, and we have um, uh, several tens, uh, maybe even 100 exoplanets known at that time, and they cover, you know, all kinds of different sizes now and a range of orbital periods. Um, but these are kind of the easy targets that ground-based surveys could discover. So a lot of large planets that are easier to detect because they cause deeper dips um, in light or they cause a more massive um, wobble or Doppler effect on the star, which is another method to find a planet. But so when Kepler launched after four years, you get this um, amazing bounty of planets shown in yellow now. So if I flip back to the previous slide, can. Let's see. There we go. 
um, then you see this, and then you see the big bounty from Kepler pop in. And this bounty of yellow points has told us uh, many things, <laughs> but um, one of the most important things is that it's told us, yes, you know, planets are common because we found so many of them with Kepler, um, but also we found a lot of small planets that are between Earth and Neptune, so uh, that big yellow clump between one and four um, times the size of Earth. So we found a lot of planets that it's, you know, we never have seen before because all we have in our solar system is Earth and Venus are similar size, and then you jump up to Neptune and Uranus. So we have nothing in between Earth and Neptune, but yet Kepler's telling us that these size planets are just insanely common. So that was, you know, revolutionary. And so in total, we have now all these different populations of exoplanets that we know of, um, from these small rocky planets that are, you know, one or two times the size of Earth. And the ones that are a bit larger than that, like Neptune size, they're considered to be ice giants like Neptune or potentially water ocean worlds that are um, just have a bunch of like water on their surface. And then we have populations of these giant massive planets that are either really close to their star, so they're hot Jupiters, or we have cold gas giant planets like our own Jupiter. And then also we have things that we call lava worlds, which are, um, you know, small rocky planets, but they're orbiting so close to their stars, like within one or two days <laughs> orbital periods, you know, compared to our own year <laughs> orbital period, that these things are just so insanely close to their star that they are um, either disintegrating or uh, affected such that they are like molten lava, essentially, on their surface. So, you know, we have a huge diversity of planets that we know about now. So, ultimately, from all this, we can say we now believe that planets actually outnumber stars in the galaxy. So we know that there's billions and millions of stars, but now we know that planets are just as common, and in fact, we know that many stars have multiple planets, like the sun does, which makes sense, um, but also, on average, you know, any star you look up at the sky, on average, has at least one planet. So there's just, you know, again, this amazing bounty of planets that have been discovered. So given that, you might say, well, why do we need any other missions after Kepler? You know, Kepler's discovered so much. Um, but there's a few reasons for, for needing new exoplanet missions. And um, first, before I get to Kepler, I have to... Um, say a few words about the K2 mission because K2 is basically acting as like a pathfinder for tests and it, it came about after Kepler. So the Kepler mission um, came or, or ended in 2013, um, but the K2 mission started up in 2014 and it's using the same Kepler spacecraft uh, to do observations um, just like Kepler did and look for things like transiting planets. Um, but the reason that the K2 mission came about was because the Kepler spacecraft uh, effectively broke. <laughs> so you can only point um, accurately in um, two axes of motion instead of three. So instead, your third axis of motion is balanced by solar pressure. And so because of this, special um, configuration, you're forced to look in the ecliptic plane of the sky, which is illustrated on this chart here. And you see a bunch of patches that are indicating the um, different parts of the sky that the K2 mission has now observed, compared to the single patch that Kepler observed before. But K2 only observes for 80 days at a time, each patch, while Kepler observed one field for four years straight, basically. So K2 has observed a lot of different fields now compared to Kepler, but it's observed them each for a much shorter amount of time. But still, you can see from all these numbers that I've thrown up here that um, the K2 mission, it's been going for about four years now. It has observed a lot of different stars and galaxies. And in fact, this chart is out of date. Um, so if I update it, it's we're no longer at 
about 200 confirmed planets, but we have over 300 confirmed planets from K2, and several, seven, almost 800 candidate planets that are um, awaiting confirmation via various techniques. And so the point of um, K2 was to kind of expand on Kepler's legacy and use a spacecraft that's still, you know, reasonably functional. Uh, but now also by design, it's been able to look at a bunch of cool stars. So I'm, I highlight that there's been 50,000 cool stars observed, but again, this chart is old. So that number has actually gone up a lot. And the reason why that's important is you want to observe cool stars um, because they tend to be smaller than the sun. And that actually makes it easier to find small transiting planets around them because it's a ratio of, of transit depths. Um, of the transit depth is a ratio between the planet size and the star size. And so really, this K2 mission essentially has acted as a pathfinder for TESS because it started the survey of small stars to look for planets around them. And that's really what TESS um, was designed to do. So TESS saw, you know, people who developed TESS, they saw how successful Kepler is and was and is. And they said, okay, you know, that's great. Now we know planets are common. So what can we do next to improve upon this? Well, now we can search for planets around the closest stars that are bright and small and, you know, nearby, um, relatively nearby to us compared to Kepler. But let's do it over the basically the whole sky. So this way we can sample, you know, not just one part of the galaxy or even just a few parts along the ecliptic, but let's sample as much of the sky as we can and search for planets. And so that's why TESS was designed. And you can see on the um, on the slide here that the Kepler footprint field of view is still shown, and the TESS field of view is shown for comparison on top of that Kepler um, a footprint. And I'll show you um, really just how big the test footprint is to show you how much of the sky it surveys at a single time. And as another um, kind of example of the difference between Kepler and TESS, Kepler observed, um, you know, again, towards one part of the sky, but it sampled um, a distance, stars out to a distance of about 3,000 light years or so. TESS is instead going to survey the smaller, closer in circle close to us in our solar neighborhood of about 300 light years away, um, up to 300 light years. So, you know, it's going to observe all the closest stars and then um, many that are further away, but, you know, much closer than what Kepler surveyed in general. And it's in total going to survey about 85 or a bit more than 85% of the sky compared to Kepler, again, just observing not even 1% of the sky. So these are, you know, some, some significant differences, but this tells you why these missions are so complementary. And so this slide also um, really demonstrates the reason why we want to target some of these uh, smaller, cooler stars. Because it, again, if you look at the sun and you look at for planets around the sun using the transit method, you can see the size of that dip in the red curve is you know, pretty small. And then when you go to that same size planet around a small star, you get a much deeper dip in brightness. And that just makes it so much easier to find planets around small stars. And, you know, that's why, again, the K2 mission having success at finding a lot of planets around small stars has shown us further that, you know, tests will be successful for sure. So TESS actually, you know, I, um, I talk about the development of TESS, but it did launch. So it's up in space now, um, which is exciting. It launched on April 18th on a SpaceX Falcon 9. And um, my picture that, that I personally took, because I was there at the launch, is shown on the left um, from our view on the beach. And it was actually outside the Saturn um, 5 uh, Visitor Center. Um, this was from Kennedy Space Center. And, you know, it was just a picture-perfect day, picture-perfect launch. It was really fantastic um, to be there. And, you know, the cool thing was 
if you're watching it on the SpaceX webcast, you could see tests literally in space. There's the payload <laughs> coming off um, the, the little test spacecraft coming out of the rocket uh, once it's actually been up in space. So, you know, it's, it's again, it was just super exciting to see that. And it was a great day because we got to, you know, be in Florida with all our colleagues and take a few vacation days. Um, but also, uh, this all these people in this picture were, or have been, or are um, currently involved in tests in some way. So whether they're they help develop the mission or you know are are part of the team that's going to help find planets from the mission, um, a, a lot of these people were able to make it in person. So it was really great to get a group photo. And again, I highlighted me there so you can spot me in the crowd. Um, but yeah, it was a great, great day. So, you know, now it's up in space, which is fantastic. And um, it, it's actually finished commissioning. So it started science observations. And so what it's doing right now is it's looking um, at different parts of the sky, of course, um, as I'll show you on the next chart, um, but it has four cameras that are observing at the same exact time simultaneously. So you can see here how big that, um, that field of view spans for the cameras reach. And so there's four individual cameras that cover one, some parts of the sky. And every 30 minutes, TESS is taking an image so each camera is taking a complete image of its field of view. And so you're collecting data basically every 30 minutes for that entire blue highlighted region that all the cameras are seeing. However, there's little circles um, pointing out some specific stars, basically. And what this is showing is that there are a certain number of stars in, in this um, strip that are observed and have data collected for every two minutes, so at a more rapid cadence. And um, this, that, that two minute special cadence is really designed to, um, to enable um, additional planet discovery um, by sampling the, the, the star's brightness um, at a more frequent you know, timing. So that way you can get basically higher um, precision data and get more information from your transit light curves. And also it's used, the two minute cadence is used for other science as well. Um, so even though not every star is observed at two minutes, you still get that whole swath at 30 minutes, which really allows you to um, do a, you know, <laughs> so much science is gonna be insane. So, and I'll show you on, on further slides here. Um, you know, just how much data this is going to be. And so what TESS is doing, so that was just one slice I showed you before. And what it's doing is it's staring at one slice for 27 days and taking an image every 30 minutes for most stars or some stars at every two minutes. But it's going to actually do that, you know, for one slice for 27 days, we call it a sector. And then it's going to step around the sky and it's going to do the Southern Ecliptic Hemisphere see if I can replay this. Yeah, it, the Southern Ecliptic Hemisphere, it's going to do that in its first year of operations. And then it's going to flip over and survey the Northern Ecliptic Hemisphere in its second year of observations, just as shown in this uh, movie. So with this, you're getting, you know, again, more than 85% of the sky sampled. And there's red regions highlighted um, at the end of this, this little graphic because there, because the, you know, the sky is curved, <laughs> you're getting overlap at certain regions of the sky. And so what this means is showing you on a static diagram here is that some parts of the sky will be observed for 27 days only as shown in blue. And some will be observed at um, a much longer amount of time. So up to 351 days for those Northern um, pole or Northern and Southern pole regions. And that's really great because you can basically look for some really high value planets because um, we call them high value because they're going to be longer orbital periods. Um, you can look for um, planets that, for example, are possibly in the habitable zones of their stars. 
So all these planets that orbit really close to their stars, they're way too hot to have liquid water. But if you observe a star long enough, you might be able to see, you know, planets that are further away and have temperatures that could support liquid water on their surface. So that's, you know, one of the really exciting regions of parameter space that tests will, will cover is looking for planets um, in at least those, you know, parts of the sky for, um, for potential habitable zone type of studies. And another neat thing about TESS is that um, it's on this highly elliptical orbit around the Earth. And so you see in this graphic that TESS um, is observing for, um, actually it observes, so I said it observes each part of the sky for 27 days. It's actually observing each for 13 point, you know, something days. And then it whips around and it downlinks 13 worth, days worth of data to Earth, and then it continues observing that same part of the sky for another 13 days. And um, it's, the, the reason it's in this orbit, well, there's a couple of reasons. And one of them is that it's, it's pointing in the anti-sun um, direction, so that way, you know, the sun is always on the opposite side, so it can always have, you know, nice, um, uh, dark skies to look at basically. <laughs> um, but also that means that on Earth we're able, once we get the data down and we can try to look for new planets and, and things, um, we can basically observe the same parts of the sky that Tess is observing um, if we get the data down fast enough and, and process it fast enough. So within a couple weeks of downlink we basically hope to have planet candidates out so that we can then go follow up to try to measure masses and things like that. Um, so, you know, it's, it, the orbit offers a good opportunity for um, rapid um, observations to look at any of the new discoveries that TESS has made. And so this is a simulated image um, of, of one part of what TESS will see, and I'll show you a real image shortly. Um, but I want to show you this for scale first because this, um, all the, the individual white splotches are stars, and this is just one degree um, on the sky. And if you look now, relative to Tessa's full cameras, that little, that this entire green square is just one part of one CCD, one, one part of, of one detector, and each individual camera has four detectors. So this is now the field of view from a single camera. And remember the strips, um, the sectors, have four cameras that are observing simultaneous at one time. So this kind of gives you, you know, the, the idea of the scale of the test field of view. And to put it into even uh, better perspective, I love this analogy, metaphor, whatever you want to call it the entire Orion constellation would fit inside the field of view from a single test camera. So if you imagine, you know, how big Orion is on the sky, um, that's how big one camera, how much sky one camera from test sees at a time. So it's really, you know, so much data. <laughs> and now, so this though is an actual image from tests. Um, this was released back in May, so it launched in April, and this came out about a month later. It's the first test image from part of, from one part of one of the four cameras. So again, this wasn't even a full camera's worth a, you know, a picture. Um, but it, again, shows you, you know, just the, hey, that the cameras are working, which is great. That's always what we always want to see. Um, and B, you know, the, the density of stars that we have, the amount of data we're going to have is just um, incredible. And I pointed out uh, one particular star of interest, Beta Centauri, um, this was taken um, of that region of the sky. So now you can recognize, hey, you know, Tess observed this back in May. And um, Tess, so Tess officially started science operations uh, at the end of July. So about a month ago now, um, but right before it started science observations, it, there was another um, release of kind of a teaser <laughs> of, of data from the mission and what it can do beyond 
looking at stars um, for planets. And in particular, this is um, showing, it's a movie, I'll, I'll start it in a second, but it's showing you um, actually a part of, of two of the detectors. So there's a gap, the, the solid gray shows a gap between detectors um, that, are, that are on a giving camera. And you see a really bright object on the left there. And that is actually um, a comet that TESS happened to observe um, during its commissioning period when it was testing out uh, uh, observations. And um, you'll notice that not, uh, once I start the movie, you'll notice a few other things or features about this, this movie. Um, but you know, I'll just start the movie and I'll let you see. I'm gonna, it's gonna keep looping. So first, you'll see that A, the comet is moving, as it should be, which, you know, is just exciting that Tess captured it. And you also see that, um, hopefully you can see this on your screen, that there's a tail of, of light, you know, that, that is um, waving about. It's, it looks all wispy, and it's changing over the course of the these observations, which were, um, there, there's a timestamp in the corner, and it's, you know, several hours worth of data, at least. And you can see, you know, amazingly, Tess was able to capture this comet and see its um, tail in action. And also, you'll see a few other things moving around. There's another bright point. If you just stare at it long enough, I could stare at this all day. <laughs> but if you stare at it long enough, you'll see um, other objects moving that are um, solar system objects, and you'll see other um, objects that are blinking in and out, like from white to black. And so this was um, this image is what we call a difference image, and basically the the black and white blinking objects are showing you what is changing in in these objects. So some of these are variable stars that you know have significant changes in brightness over time. And you're seeing them blink in and out. Um, you're also seeing um, an effect. The, the other streaks are an effect. Actually, Mars was in the field <laughs> um, at this time. And so you're seeing like kind of a, a reflection effect from Mars um, in those other bright streaks on the image in the movie. So again, th this movie is online. Um, tests, the test.mit.edu website has um, links to this film. And the Goddard website also has links, but it's just, I could stare at it all day. <laughs> but um, I won't do that now. Um, I wanted to, to talk about a few more things. Um, first is that, you know, okay, so those are just two sneak peeks, basically, of, of what TESS has released so far in terms of, you know, what it's done during its commissioning period and how it's gotten everything sorted out. Um, so that it could start science, as I mentioned, uh, at the end of July, and it did start science. And so what that means now is that it's going, um, it's working on, you know, doing its, its survey of the Southern Ecliptic Hemisphere. And then in January of 2019, um, right now the working date is January 25th, 2019, there's going to be the first actual data release from tests. And so um, that will contain the first four sectors of data. So the first four 27 day chunks. Um, and that's going to be publicly available um, to everybody, um, to me, to you, everybody at the same time. <laughs> and um, after that um, release, they, uh, the plan is that there's going to be um, a more rapid release of data. So they're basically taking now the first six months of science to look at the data and, you know, vet the data, validate it, and make sure they have all their ducks in a row and everything. You know, they understand any quirks in the data um, so that they can explain it to users. And then once that's all sorted out, they'll, they'll be able to have a more rapid data release in the future. And so We'll, we'll probably get to the point where we're having data released every um, couple months at least um, for you know a next couple years for tests uh, as it completes its southern survey and then the northern survey and then after that so the the northern survey will be done by uh, 
So this timeline is, you know, shifted a little bit, but it'll be done by uh, mid 2020 or so. And um, they're going to be proposing, MIT will be proposing for an extended mission. And so what that extended mission will consist of is to be determined. But, you know, we're hoping that we can continue to use the spacecraft to collect data because it's um, actually doesn't require that much fuel um, to operate and its orbit is very stable. So it could in theory operate and function well for um, a couple decades. So, you know, we're hoping that, um, that we have some extended mission that comes out and can continue exoplanet surveys or other things, but that remains to be seen right now. Um, but in any case, um, I think I'm gonna skip these slides and just um, basically point out that um, all the data, so again, this is going to be um, the images of, from each sector that are taken every 30 minutes, and then uh, several um, select stars, like these will be thousands, tens of thousands of stars observed at every two minutes. All that data is going to be at this archive. Um, and as I mentioned before, it'll be accessible, you know, at come January 2019 to everybody. And so you can go on there and you can see um, the, you can look at the, the pixel level data, you'll be able to see light curves um, generated by the project for the, the various data. And um, you'll be able to, to play with this um, at your leisure, whatever you wanna do since it's open to the public. And um, in addition, so the, the office that I work for is, um, as I mentioned before, it's a test science support center at Goddard. And, you know, the, the main test science mission out of MIT is to find exoplanets, which is what we all want. <laughs> um, but our, our goal at Goddard, too, is to also enable um, all kinds of science. And so we um, funded several scientists to do non-exoplanet science with TESS, um, but also to do a different variety of exoplanet science. So there's, there's all kinds of things that we're supporting. And so there are a few different tools um, that we have to help people with data analysis and we have a help desk, for example. So if anyone is interested in getting, you know, playing with the data once it comes live, um, they can access um, us um, via this website. And so I just wanted to um, wrap up here with um, a couple more slides and show you, you know, okay, all that all said and done, what might tests actually find? And there have been um, various simulations of, of the types of planets tests might find. And this is one version where um, this is showing the planet radius, as I showed earlier on the, on the vertical scale. Um, but now the horizontal scale is showing distance from us. So um, the much closer stars um, are, you know, at, at 10 parsecs or even closer. And so the um, folks have simulated that tests will find all the orange circles. So it's going to fill in basically, as, as we talked about, a lot of planets around nearby stars compared to blue, which is the Kepler, which observed much more distant stars. And it's going to find uh, many small planets, just like Kepler did, because we know they're common. But also, the size of the signal, or the, the size of the circles that are shown, are um, telling you basically how good these targets are going to be um, to do studies of their atmospheres in the future. And so uh, you see a bunch of big black circles around like 10 parsecs. So these are planets discovered by other surveys that um, are phenomenal targets for, for um, studying their atmospheres. Um, but TESS is going to fill in this gap with, you know, even more small planets and, and um, some that are even closer, some around some of the closest stars. And so um, TESS is going to just provide a huge enough bounty that we can do statistical studies of exoplanet atmospheres, which we can't really do right now. We just don't have enough of them that are um, amenable to atmospheric characterization. And so in this way, um, you know, ultimately we want to know 
where do we point the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope that's um, going to be a powerhouse for studying exoplanet atmospheres? You know, what are the best planets to study with this telescope? And TESS is going to help answer that question. TESS is our finder scope, essentially. So this is to scale, showing you how tiny TESS is, you know, compared to, to James Webb. And it literally could be a finder scope for, for it. So um, we're really excited about what TESS will find to enable all kinds of future studies. And so I'll just end on this slide, you know, say, you know, wrap it up, say, well, TESS will find, you know, a lot of benchmark planets that we will study for decades. And, you know, we can use all kinds of telescopes to study test planets because test planets are going to be around nearby bright stars. So we can use also the currently operating Hubble telescope um, and the future James Webb telescope. We can do all kinds of things to better understand these planets and um, ultimately, you know, better characterize their atmospheres and determine how many might be in habitable zones, you know, how many might potentially have liquid water. These are things that we want to try to answer. And so I will um, leave it at that and say, you know, I'm happy to take um, any questions that, about tests um, if you want to get involved. Again, with looking at the data yourself, <laughs> um, that, you know, I'll say um, stay tuned for some of that with the bulk data release coming up in January. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. This is fantastic. I, I, I learned a whole lot. There's a, a lot more to this mission that I, I didn't know about, and so I really appreciate this. Um, before we get to the first question, I want to remind everyone that uh, if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A window rather than the chat window. We'll uh, have a better chance of finding it that way. So uh, let's see. Let's go Back, Scott asked a question, uh, can sunspots, perhaps many, be mistaken for an exoplanet? And uh, might this, uh, I guess there's a follow-up question here. So I'll let you answer that one and then there's a second question. Sure. You know. Yeah, I'll back up here if I can to, since I'm still sharing. Oops. Yeah, so this, that's a perfect um, question actually. So for example, on, um, the end dwarf that's pictured, illustrated here, you know, you see a bunch of dark spots that are sunspots or star spots. And just as our sun has varying levels of sunspot activity. And so it is true that um, some of these spots can uh, mimic transiting planets. Um, but the good thing is that um, a transit of a planet, let's say test discovers all these planets and, you know, some of them might actually be false planets due to sunspots. What we can do is once we know where and when to look from tests, we can use other telescopes to look at these planets as well, but at different wavelengths of light. And so basically we can compare then the test transit depths, um, which is kind of like a reddish optical filter. Um, we can compare that with, let's say, bluer optical or further infrared um, observations to see if there's any difference in the transit depth. And that will tell you um, in bulk if it's actually some solid opaque body of a planet or if it's instead a, a star spot contrast that we're seeing. So basically we, a lot of this, um, all these planets will require uh, additional observations to follow up, but TESS makes it easy on us on the front end by finding, you know, telling us where and when to look. <laughs> So yeah, so we'll hopefully be able to mitigate a lot of the, the star spot false detections. I think uh, there was another, uh, Scott had a kind of a second question here and I think it had to do with this idea of false positives. Uh, uh, something about mistaking the rotation of the star for the orbiting planet. And I, I know that there's variations uh, mm -hmm. other than sunspots uh, mm -hmm. that can you know, lead to differences in luminosities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah. So stellar stars are not as um, they're, they're more active than we would like them to be <laughs> when we're when we're trying to look for planets, especially small planets. But um, again, if um, we can kind of do or we can do the same thing to mitigate any stellar effects by um, following up and looking at different wavelengths of light, and also. Um, 
if we measure a mass, you know, we can combine that measured mass with the measured transit depth and, and which gives us the radius and say, okay, is this actually, you know, a valid planet or is the mass just way off? You know, is it, can we even detect it? You know, if it's not a planet, then we shouldn't really see um, any type of Doppler wobble signal that would be of a planetary level, um, especially because we're targeting small stars. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things that um, we will need to do to mitigate stellar activity and star spots and all that. But um, there are definitely plans in place for that. All right. Okay, Ken asks, uh, the cameras are taking pictures every 30 minutes. And uh, just uh, maybe to confirm what you said, of the same part of the sky, or is each new image a slightly different part of the sky due to the orbital motion of the spacecraft? Hmm. Yeah, the orbital motion, um, it actually, so it's able to stay pointed uh, well enough, um, or as far as we know, definitely precisely enough so that it is staring at, at the same exact part of the sky. So like a single blue strip is staring at the same exact part of the sky for 27 days in total. And then you purposefully step and stare at the next one, you know, every 27 days. So you, um, because the pointing of the spacecraft is so precise, if it wasn't precise, we would have a problem, but all signs have shown that it's, it's very stable. Okay, well, this is, this is kind of a follow-up. Stuart asked, due to the fact that TESS will observe its areas over relatively short spans of time, uh, relative to Kepler anyway, um, is it likely that it will miss some possible transits? Is there some way to extrapolate from the actual number of observed transits the number that potentially would have been seen? Mm. Yeah, so there's a couple um, ways to answer this, too. <laughs> so the... So the parts of the sky where it will observe for only 27 days, like all the blue strips in this image, um, means that preferentially will only uh, easily identify the shortest period planets, the closest in planets. Um, but there will be cases where um, we detect maybe, you know, one transit in that 27 days. And you can actually get a rough approximation of the period from even a single transit. So then we could use other telescopes to try to confirm a second transit and so on. Um, so that's part of what we can do. Um, another part is that, yeah, the, so TESS is, um, it is going to miss a lot of the longer period planets in these regions. So one idea for the extended mission is to, you know, maybe go back and then just repeat this so that you can build up the, the baseline and get even more data. Um, so that's one option um, to find longer period planets. But the good thing, even though it's only observing for some, you know, some of these stars of 27 days, is that for small stars, the habitable zone is much closer in. So for the coolest stars, the habitable zone is like around a couple weeks of an orbital period compared to our one year. So in theory, you could still find planets around um, really cool stars that are possibly in their habitable zones, even in the 27 day period. And so that's since, you know, TESS really wants to just find a bunch of small planets. It doesn't really care about their period too much, but it still has a potential to find a lot of cool ones that might have liquid water. Right. Okay, Cook asked a question, and we might need to get uh, a little bit of clarification, or maybe you can um, answer, because I think that there would be two ways. He says, what magnitude can TESS detect? And I wasn't sure if he was meaning uh, absolute magnitude of them or the apparent magnitude that we would see from here. Hmm. I'm guessing the latter. Yeah, so it's easier to, to answer the apparent magnitude. <laughs> so <laughs> for sure, <laughs> I would have to think about the absolute <laughs> Um, yeah, the apparent magnitude test is, is designed, um, again, I said, with this kind of reddish optical filter. Um, so it's sort of peaked towards um, these cooler M dwarf stars that, that have their um, black body light peaks in the infrared. But in any case, we can detect maybe about, um, to, with a decent amount, 
decent level of precision. Um, planets around stars of 15, 16th magnitude um, in this kind of like an I band filter, you know, reddish optical. Um, so with more data, you could go fainter, but again, Tess wants to really just, um, Tess is designed to do all the bright stars, you know, cause that's, that's what's easiest for us to, to characterize in every which way. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we but we could reasonably do up to 15th or 16th magnitude, apparent magnitude. Okay, and I, I think I heard the answer to this one uh, embedded in that answer, but Ray asked, what wavelengths are uh, Tess observing it? Yeah, so it is a, um, I, I said a reddish optical filter. It's, it's a single, um, just a single wavelength, um, basically like a single rod band filter. So it doesn't observe at more than one wavelength. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know what, actually, I have a backup slide on that. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about it, it should be, yeah, perfect, right here. So it's um, from about 600 to 1,000 ish nanometers. Um, so you can see the Kepler band pass is the light gray, lighter gray, and that one um, was slightly bluer wavelength coverage. And so TESS is optimized you know, slightly to the red, redder wavelengths. All right. So uh, David asks, I think that this is a little bit related because it, you know, it depends on all those things. How many stars do you anticipate uh, are within reach of tests within that 300 light year radius? Hmm. Um, that is a great question. So I know that we, people have simulated finding thousands of planets. Um, I have, let's see. I have one more backup slide somewhere. So, oops, except I skipped over it, hold on. So, so there's a plot I'm trying to bring up. There we go. These are um, all the stars within just 80 light years of the sun. And, you know, the, the idea is that um, we will survey in the end more stars than we can imagine in the 30 minute images. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but the two minute images, um, we're observing, oh gosh, on the order of um, tens of tens of tens of thousands um, every two minutes. And so um, that will get us to um, at, you know, several hundred planets, at, you know, out to apparent magnitudes of 16 or so for the star. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of, um, you know, we're kind of staying with uh, the kind of planets that we can, you know, perhaps detect with this. Scott asks, longer period planets are more distant from the star. Is it the method of test Kepler bias towards finding planets orbiting close to the star? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, just because you need the right angle to see a transit in the first place. So that means in theory or a priori, you are biased towards shorter period planets. Um, but that's why, uh, so that's why it's very difficult to find long period planets from the ground um, because, you know, we have day night cycles and um, that really impacts our ability to find anything longer than like even two weeks, I think might be the longest planet found from the ground, the oral period. Um, but then Kepler, has shown us that, you know, if we stare long enough, <laughs> we will find long period planets. And uh, with Tess, you know, we will find, again, more of these shorter period planets around, it, at least in the parts of the sky observed for just 27 days. Um, but, you know, since we're staring at enough stars in the sky, um, we will just by, you know, default of everything that's been discovered so far, we will um, be able to find a lot of planets at, at a range of orbital periods, but still definitely biased towards shorter ones. Um, so time will tell, <laughs> really. Okay, well, we're running close to the end and we're gonna do one more question here. And I, we apologize for um, some really great questions that we're not quite getting, it, getting to. Um, but Michael asks, when examining a transit and determining planet size, how do you decide whether you're looking at a large planet close to a star so it looks relatively smaller, or a small planet closer um, to test, so it looks larger. 
Uh, okay, yeah, so the idea is that um, we are so far away, even the closest stars that we're surveying, we're still so far away from them that the um, relative distance of the planet to its star um, actually doesn't impact how we measure the radius at all. So um, it's, it's, I guess, if you want to call it a geometric effect, just that we, we ourselves and Tess are orbiting around Earth um, is, are so far from the stars that we just don't see um, any effect from the stellar and planet exoplanet distances between relative to each other. So it's um, not like how, um, how we have the planets in our solar system that we can tell the apparent size changes, you know, when it's closer to Earth. Um, these planets are just too far away. We don't see that effect at all. All right. Well, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing? Okay. I'm glad that, we, uh, that you kept sharing because you had some really great uh, slides there and yeah. backups that uh, ended up being rather, fa fairly important to uh, answering the questions. So um, that's all for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much to our speaker, Nicole Colon. Um, you know, this is a wonderful webinar and, and this will be available on the Night Sky Network uh, website in the Outreach Resources section. And uh, this will also be posted on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next few days so you could be looking for those and again nicole thank you so much this is wonderful thank you so much for uh um sharing with us thank you